right. Uh, thank you, everybody, um, for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Christopher Carmona. I'm going to be the moderator for this event. So this is our third talk in the History Has Eyes on You series. These are our monthly sessions where we talk about the different issues um, that are going on in the literary world, um, out in the real world. And we talked last time we had a entire um, presentation just devoted to monuments and to mascots and the role of those plays. Our first one really talked about shared histories between Latinos and African Americans. And today we are going to be talking about Latino Latinx representation um, in literature, media, and um, and popular culture, and the lack thereof of of that kind of thing. And so, what so what we have today is a panel of of four people that are going to be talking about their very the, the various interactions with um, how we deal with the subject, how as writers we are talking about, as well as scholars dealing with the uh, the concept of. Um, of you know representation and why it matters in our society and why it matters for Latino writers at this point, um, and you know specifically we're focusing on the Latino experience for this talk, and so I'm going to go ahead and start um, before we get started here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Gerald Padilla, who is the editor and founder of Jade Publishing, who is the host of these events that are happening uh, tonight. So, uh, Jerry. Thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, my name is Gerald Padilla. Uh, I go by Jerry also. Um, and it's, of course, our pleasure to help sponsor these events. Um, Jade Publishing is, is a fairly new publishing company. We started about two, three years ago, um, <clears throat> my wife and I. And so, we both had our kind of our reasons of why we wanted to start, but for me, it started in the classroom. And I was teaching um, a sixth grade class one year. And every year we have to cover, uh, because of course our uh, uh, edu public education is so Eurocentric, we always have to um, cover things such as uh, uh, anything that has to do with Greek, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and the kids are great. Kids, kids know all of that stuff. But one day while I was uh, there in, in that school in, in Donna, which is about 20 minutes uh, from the border, um, in a classroom full of uh, Mexican, -American, Mexican or Mexican American students, I felt like we needed to compare these uh, European mythologies and try to bring some of our own mythologies. And of course, to my surprise, um, our students did not know anything. And so here I was, um, you know, a, a Mexican American teacher with a classroom full of Mexican American students, and um, we were basically failing our students because we, we weren't teaching them uh, about their own cultures. And so um, I uh, asked this very simple question just to know where the students were, uh, and I asked them about pyramids. And so the students responded, I, the question was, can anybody tell me where there are pyramids? Of course, everybody's hands go up, um, and of course, everybody says Egypt. And so their hands went down and I asked the question again. Uh, and the question was, well, where else besides Egypt do we have pyramids? And uh, nobody knew. Nobody knew that, um, you know, in a country that was literally 20 miles away from them, their ancestors um, had created pyramids. And to me, that just, just destroyed me as an educator. It just really uh, broke my heart to know where our community was. And so I went back home with Rossi and I, we talked about this issue. And of course we said, you know, we have to, we have to do something about it. And uh, Rossi being the, the, the very strong-willed and determined person she is, she said, well, you know what, we have to make these stories available for our kids. And so that's basically how Jade Publishing was, was born. And since then we've been um, providing these stories, this uh, mythology, um, fiction and nonfiction to our community. So, um, some of these books are for, you know, the smaller audiences. For example, this one, uh, No Animals of My Land, Animales de Mi Tierra, is a trilingual book in Nahuatl, Spanish, and English. Um, we have other books that um, talk about the same uh, topics or themes. We have, for example, Aztectopia, which is comic books. 
um, from Pedro Lares. And uh, we have a wide variety of books. Uh, some, of course, are in Nahuatl, but we have also published books in, in Mayan, Mayan Quiche. Um, for example, this one, uh, and uh, poetry, Mayan poetry also in Mayan Quiche, um, and also English and Spanish. So uh, we look forward to continue publishing these types of books and promoting our stories so our um, children, our youth, and also our adults can learn a little bit more about our own culture, uh, our own history. And of course, one of the books that we're very proud of, of as well is El Rincha, which talks about you know, the Texas uh, history. And this is, of course, a book by Christopher Carmona. Um, it talks about the, the situation with the Texas Rangers and the Tejano uh, community, the Mexican community uh, here in the early 20th century. And of course, the, the historical co conflict that occurred uh, due to the violent out, um, outbursts from the Texas Rangers. So these are stories that uh, you typically don't find in public schools. These are stories that uh, are not told. And so our job is to is to make um, them available for our community. And so we're very proud of, of the work that we've done, of the authors that we've collaborated with, the artists, they've done a phenomenal uh, work and we look forward to continuing this type of effort. And I'll go ahead and pass it back to Chris. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so well, what our topic is tonight is dealing with the uh, Latinx representation in literature, comics and the media. And we're looking at it as a in different, different context here. Um, so one of the first things I want to say before we get started with our, with our presentation and introduce the panelists here is um, if we're going to be taking questions, um, you guys can put your questions into the chat box. And I will go ahead and address them after the end of the presentations as we start to open up the questions. And uh, of course, you get, when we open up the panel for Q&A, you can also you know, chime in and ask your question there as well. But if you have a question and you want to just go ahead and put it in the chat box and we will address them at the end here. Um, and also just to let you know is, is uh, to make sure you guys keep your mics on mute if you, uh, so that uh, you don't disturb our panelists here as we're doing this. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start. So our first presenter will be John Moran Gonzalez. And John is uh, from the border town of Brownsville. Um, he is the Frank J. Doby Regents Professor of American and English Literature and the Director for the Center for Mexican American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He has authored two monographs, Border, Resist uh, Border Renaissance, the Texas Centennial and the Emergence of Mexican American Literature, and The Troubled Union, Expansionist Imperatives in Post-Reconstruction American Novels. He is also the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Latina, Latino American Literature, and the co with uh, and co-editor with uh, Laura Lamos of the Cambridge History of Latino and, La and Latino and Latino uh, literature, American literature, um, which was selected for 2018 um, choice outstanding academic title. And also, he is a, a member of the Refusing to Forget Pro uh, Public History Project. And so that uh, that that would be our first speaker. Our second speaker is going to be Sochi Julissa Benmejo, and she is the daughter of Mexican immigrants and the author of Posada, Offerings of Witness and Refuge, which was published by Sundress Publications in 2016. She's a former Steinbeck Fellow and Poets and Writers, uh, California Writers Exchange winner. She has poetry and prose published in Asento's Review, Crazy Horse, Los Angeles Review of Books, and Pank, amongst others. A dramatization of her poem, Our Lady of the Water Gowns, directed by Jesus Salvador Trevino, can be viewed at latinotopia.com. And she is a member of the Misera Miresa Collective and Director of Women Who Submit. Um, and the third presenter will be um, Catherine Marla Watson. Catherine is originally from San Antonio. Um, She's originally from San Antonio. She attended San Antonio Community College um, and then earned her BA in English and Spanish from UT Austin. She subsequently earned her MA in English Literature at UTSA with a focus on um, Latina, Latino, Latinx Literary and Cultural Studies and then earned a PhD in American Studies with a certificate 
in gender and women's studies and geography from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Dr. Merla Watson is currently the co-director of gender and women's studies and an associate professor in Mexican American studies at UTRGV. She has published several journals and collected works and co-edited with Ben Olguin the collected works of the Mundos, Latina and Latino Speculative Literature, Film, and Popular Culture, which won the American Book Award in 2018. And finally, we have Isaac Chavarria, who is a pocho from Deep South Texas. His work assisting nonprofit organizations produced over 20 chapbooks for workshop participants. His poems are in Label Me Latino Latina, Border Senses, and New Border Contemporary Voices from the Texas Mexico Border. His poetry book, Pocho, from Slu Press, received the inaugural 2014 Knox Tejas Best Poetry Award. His group affiliations include um, the Coalition of Nuevo Chicano and Chicano Artists. Uh, I could never pronounce this, Chochalichex and Cardinalic Dex, his collection, his collaboration as a member of the Coalition for Nueva, Nueva Chicano Artists developed into a co-edited book called Nuevas Voces Poeticas, a dialogue about new Chicano, Chicano identities. He is currently the co-editor on Interstice, the literary journal of South Texas, and co-runs a mobile bookstore with me. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to John. John is going to be speaking about um, the, the Latino writers as they are depicted on the border in contrast to how border regions are often depicted in mass media. So let's go ahead and welcome John Moran Gonzalez. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, th thanks to Jerry and the Jade Publishing for this uh, wonderful forum uh, to share ideas and thoughts uh, on, on these important topics. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, start with, uh, you know, my part will be dealing with uh, uh, Latinos and the border because uh, in, in recent years uh, and, or even decades, uh, Latinos have been in fact very much defined by their, you know, perceived relationship to the border or rather the idea of the border. Uh, and um, an idea of the border that has often been uh, created, uh, manufactured far from the border, right? And so, uh, and, and in other words, it presents in no way a kind of, uh, no way resembles an actuality of the lived experience on the border as, as we know it. So in, in that sense, uh, the you know we 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 have heard over recent decades the border be, become a, a a site of danger of of crisis and the borderlands is a site of crisis you know whether it's uh, unauthorized migration or migrants uh, drug smuggling uh, uh, human trafficking. Um, you name it. I mean, all the kind of ills of uh, modern society can be found all grouped together on the border, or at least the way it's been imagined often. And in other words, the border is a, is a, is a problem or a crisis to be solved in various fashions, usually through the exertion of uh, state power and violence whether it's something like the wall or detention camps or generally speaking the erosion of uh, civil liberties uh, of, of the inhabitants of, of the region uh, who are always uh, who are always suspect you know they're they're always uh, uh, somewhat criminalized I mean the uh, latest iteration of that is of course uh, you know the the bad hombres uh, of the current White House occupant. Um, but even that has a much older uh, genealogy and uh, something that has been, uh, uh, Latinx writers have, have, have very much uh, worked against. Um, just to kind of hint at how old some of this is, is that you have to go back to in the mid 1890s uh, a, a U.S. Army officer named Je John Gregory Bork uh, is sent to the is sent to the uh, Rio Grande Valley 
in order to capture uh, Caterino Garza, who was a revolutionary uh, fighting against uh, the Porfirio Diaz dictatorship, but he was doing it from the US side of the border, right? And therefore, in violation of the uh, neutrality laws of the US, uh, Pork was sent to capture um, Garza. This is after he had spent time in uh, Arizona with uh, General George Cook in, in leading the US uh, military's attempts to capture uh, Geronimo. So he's sent to the valley and writes this article called The American Congo, where he basically compares uh, the, the, the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande, as the Congo of the United States, you know, this kind of deep, dark region that nobody knows about, you know, and in fact, the implied comparison with the Congo, the Belgian, uh, with the Congo River in Belgian, uh, the Belgian Congo at that time under colonial rule, is that people on the East Coast of the United States know more about the Congo River than they do about the Rio Grande. And so, uh, this, but this idea that the space of the, of the border is one of danger, of criminality, of where sovereignty, national sovereignty, doesn't quite work or it doesn't quite fit. And the people who inhabit it are constantly taking advantage of, of the shreds and patches of sovereignty as they exist in the area. This is a very old narrative. And, uh, you know, and you see this in the kind of ways, uh, the kind of so-called debates over the border wall or, uh, you know, the way Im uh, immigration policy is, has been implemented by ICE and other federal agencies. You know, all of this is getting, getting done by people who know zero about the border. I guarantee you, they don't know anything about the actual lived reality of the border. This is not to deny that you know, these phenomena don't exist here, uh, that there isn't violence associated with them, but not in the way that they imagine, not in the way that they imagine uh, uh, it as a kind of national threat. And so anyway, um, really, uh, I want to pivot from there about that kind of uh, depiction, because it's one that we all know, we've seen it, we know that for, for, uh, God, for, for years, for decades, if not for a century or more, uh, you know, decisions about the border have been made by people who know nothing about the border and who only are seeking kind of the political uh, cachet, you know, politi to po political advantage it plays with the base that who is equally ignorant of the border. So. Uh, but then you have writers and such as, I mean, and there are numerous, uh, Norma Cantu, Ben, ben Sainz, uh, uh, Octavio Solis, um, you know, Rolando Hinojosa Smith, uh, Aristel Brito. I mean, just a whole, uh, Emmy Perez, of course, uh, Chris Carmona. You know, I mean, there, we've, we've just got, uh, a huge number of, of writers who know much more about the lived experience of the border. They know what it's what it is like, and have written eloquently uh, about this. Very much against these kind of tropings of the border as a place of criminality and danger, and degeneration. Um, uh, I'm I'm going to kind of touch upon uh, briefly on. Uh, my friend and colleague Oscar Casares' uh, novel, Where We Come From, which was published last year. And uh, because it, it sits at that intersection of how uh, uh, border folks, that is people who have grown up uh, along the border, uh, intersect and interact with migrants, uh, with uh, coyotes, with uh, ICE agents even, and, uh, but not in this kind of sensationalistic, ripped from the headlines sort of way, but rather in the kind of 
much more quiet and nuanced uh, interstices, right, of, of personal relationships. Uh, so, you know, if you haven't read it, you know, it's a great story, but basically, you know, it, it revolves around a kind of uh, older woman who lives in Brownsville who is, uh, you know, who inadvertently has her house kind of uh, uh, become a, uh, one of her houses, there are two casitas on, on a property. Uh, one of them is turned into a drop house for uh, un undocumented immigrants. And uh, she inadvertently gets involved in this smuggling ring. Uh, the, the coyotes are, are apprehended, but nonetheless, there's one who stays behind, one migrant who's uh, uh, a young a young boy named uh, Daniel, uh, who is waiting for his uh, father to uh, uh, to hear from his father to to pick him up, and then Nina is is the woman whose house this is, and her great nephew, her nephew uh, Orly, comes to visit for the summer. Orly, you know, his his dad, his family's from Brownsville, but uh, they've moved up. He's grown up in Houston. And he doesn't know what it's like on the border. He hasn't lived there, you know. But it's about how these two unlikely, you know, from very different places in the kind of generational story of migration, how they how they come together and they they meet as as uh, you know almost as brothers, really. And uh, it seems to me the point of the story where we come from, right? One, it, it's kind of a reminder to remember where you came from, right? That, you know, you, uh, this, this experience is not too far off uh, in, in the past for many of us, right? For many of our families. Uh, that story is, is a historically recent one in, in, in some instances and in others, of course, you know, folks have been there for a very, very, very long time. So, but it really is about kind of uh, uh, looking at that kind of more, uh, uh, the intersections that our communities have rather than the differences. And so I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great story really well written and I'm not just saying that because he's my friend uh, but uh, I think it really serves as a terrific antidote to uh, what uh, what is getting said elsewhere ab about the border so I'll go ahead and leave it at that and uh, turn it back over to to uh, to Chris thank you John um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and go ahead and just um, get um, Sochi on, and so Sochi is going to be talking about. She is a our one California um, of a presenter today. She's going to be talking about her work with No More Deaths in Arizona, and recently her work with Dignitaria out of uh, in Los Angeles. So let's go ahead and welcome Sochi Pulista Ben Ben Hi, um, thank you. Christopher and Jerry and um, Jade Publishing. I'm excited to be here. It's really cool to be with uh, a bunch of Tejanos and, uh, <laughs> and to like hang out with you all. So that's exciting. Um, I wanted to go uh, next because I wanted to read some poems. Um, the first one is from my book, Posada, Offerings of Witness and Refuge. And I, a part of this book is inspired by um, some time I did volunteering in the summer of 2011 with the group No More Deaths. Um, some people may have heard of them. They've been in the news over the last couple of years. Um, during, since the Trump administration, um, the crackdown on the border has gotten worse. This group is a humanitarian aid group and they used to be able to do that work along the border. But um, in recent years, they've had people arrested. There was a big court just a court hearing last year where somebody was up for a felony for giving um, water and food. I mean, that was like in the court documents that he was being accused of giving someone water and food. And it's just like, where do we live? Um, and then just this summer, they had their camp raided um, and a bunch of people were 
taken to prison and put in detention. And so um, I worked with them back in 2011 because I've always cared deeply about immigrant rights. Uh, my parents are immigrants, and so I've always done a lot of work around that. And I wanted to go out to the border to, to see it for myself and because I think a lot of people think of it as an abstraction and a wall, the wall is an abstraction. So I wanted to, like, go out there and see it and be in that space. Um, and when you go, the first few days, you're just train you get a lot of like downloaded information and you get a lot of trainings and so you get trainings on like the Tohono Odom people and their land and then you get all this history from all the different administrations and how the different administrations have affected that part of the Arizona Mexico border you get first aid training you get media training you get know your rights training and then you also go out into the desert and you're camping out with like no electricity no water uh, no running water, I mean, and then you get like survival training. Don't, this is what you do when a mountain lion comes around and all these things. Uh, and so it's like mountain lions, but then also this is what you do when an ice officer comes around. So um, that's a lot of information to take in. And so um, this poem came from all of that. Things to know for compañeros. And no more deaths volunteer guide. Did you know a baby rattlesnake venom is more lethal because it knows no control? Woolly mammoth tarantulas inch across the road at dusk, not down it. Why did the tranche across the road? To eat the chicken. Did you know everything in the desert is as alert as a needle and just as sharp? It is possible to comically sit on a cactus, though you probably won't laugh. Crimson scratches and emerald bruises will be your medals. Did you know when patrolling trails, you may encounter a mountain lion? If so, gather together, stand tall, and wave your arms. When encountering, encountering lightning, spread out and crouch close to the ground. Do not confuse the two. Did you know tu español puede ayudar a salvar una vida? Compañero is Spanish for, we are in this shit together. Do not be afraid to speak Spanish. Did you know when you, ha when you don't have a mirror and you can't care what you look like? When you can't remember what a shower feels like, dirt and sweat cake your clothes, and you want to forget everything sticking to your soul, you won't be too shy to skinny dip. Did you know when barrel cacti become tombstones and their yellow starburst blooms offerings for the dead, you won't be too cool to belt out Katy Perry songs? Did you know orange poppies grow on slopes, oak trees and creeks and washes are not thick cement slabs. A mile in the city is nothing like a mile in the desert, and as the crow flies is an optical illusion to hikers relying on handheld pixelated GPS. There will be a moment when you fantasize crashing water gallons down on the rocks, throwing off your pack, collapsing on the trail, and quitting. This is when you are to stop and rest. Did you know there are people in the desert who are never allowed rest? Did you know one gallon of water weighs 8.35 pounds? To stay hydrated, a person should drink one to two gallons a day. Migrants carry a single oil black gallon in calloused hands for a three or more day trip. Why is it black? So as not to glow. Did you know migrants are hurried over trails at night and without light? Their blisters are caused by continuous friction, muscle cramping by dehydration, vomiting by drinking bacteria-ridden cow pond water, and those who move too slow are left behind. Did you know to say I could care less is to say it is possible to care more? The careless weed is called bledo in Spanish. In Guatemala, bledo is boiled, drained, and chopped with onions, tomatoes, and cilantro. It grows wild in the desert and, if necessary, can be eaten raw. Did you know I learned about bledo from a Guatemalteca named Nancy? She could share more lessons with you than I ever could. Nancy has crossed twice. And when she talks about her daughter, Fatima, she cries. Did you know, compañero, is Spanish for willing to ask, willing to listen, willing to know. So this book came out four years ago in the fall of 2016, so right before the election, and I had this thing, this thing in my head. I was like, it's going to come out. People are going to listen. Somebody's going to pay attention. Again, I started this in 2011, right, and then not knowing that, it would, that Trump would make it his, like, flagship issue. Um, but, yeah, I had this, like, deep feeling. And, of course, you know, here we are four years later and things just keep getting 
worse and worse. Um, I wanted to read, so in 2017 in the fall, I got, I had an opportunity to go out to Gettysburg National Military Park and have a month long residency with the um, National Parks Art Foundation. And I had never really been on the East Coast that much. I'd never been in a Civil War site. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And um, again, this is, you know, early in the administration, really getting their groove of horribleness. Um, so this is Battleground, Gettysburg National Military Park. Motorcycles and white tour vans speed between behemoth granite shafts, shove my body by their force, leave me roadside and wandering fields. Little is funny when you're Chicana and walking a Civil War site not meant for walking. Regardless, I ask park rangers and guides for stories on Mexican soldiers, receive shrugs. No evidence in statues or statistics. In the cemetery, not one Spanish name. I'm alone in the wine shop. It's the same in the post office, the market, the antique shop with its KKK books on display. In the peach orchard, I prepare a seance, sit cross-legged in grass and hold a smoky quartz to the setting sun. I invite the unseen to speak. So many dead, it said Confederates were left to rot. In war, not all bodies are returned home nor graves marked. I Google Mexicans in the Civil War and uncover layers to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and Cinco de Mayo. This is how I meet ancestors for the first time, heroes. This country decorates in clownish sombreros and fake mustaches, dishonors for fighting European empire on shared American land, power and money dictate can't be shared. Years before this, Carrying water gallons up an Arizona mountain ridge to replenish supplies in a path known as Dead Man, I wrote messages on bottles to the living, scanned Sonoran canyons for the lost, and knew too many would not be found. A black Sharpie vegan drawn on hot plastic became a prayer. May the next officer halt before cracking her face beneath his boot, spilling life onto dirt. No, nothing's funny when you're brown in a country you're taught isn't yours. You're dead, don't count. And then I'm just checking how much time I have. So I'm just going to read one more. Um, this poem I wrote last year, and this is for all the children who have since been caged, put in cages, have died in those detention centers and cages, have died along the border. This is for the children. Ursa Minor. For Carlos Hernandez Vasquez, 16. Juan de Leon Gutierrez, 16. Felipe Gomez Alonso, 8. Jacqueline Cal Maquin, 7. Wilmer Josue Ramirez Vasquez, 2. Angie Valeria Martinez, 24 months. Marie Juarez, 19 months. Each star belongs to a galaxy we can't identify with the naked eye. Download the app to hold the unseen in your hands. Star registries, like the Sonoran Desert, have searchable maps. Somewhere, a 16-year-old names a star for a first love. An eight-year-old follows the northern star like a beacon. A seven-year-old sings a rhyme. And the babies, well, the babies are babbling, but their mothers know those wet, fleshy mouths are meaning estrella. In the sky, a little bear plays in a river of stars, but on the land, red dots mark the dead. Over the bodies, lay hands, over the bones, pour dirt, over the rotting country, watches a seven-point constellation. Thank you. Thank you, Sochi. And now I'm going to go ahead and move on to Catherine Merla Watson, and she's going to be talking about rewriting the white savior in contemporary Latinx literature. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Katie. Uh, 
Dr. Watson, you're muted. <laughs> Katie, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, here we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Um, uh, thank you everybody for, for being here um, virtually on this Thursday evening. Thank you to uh, Chris Carmona for facilitating this and Jade Publishing for hosting it. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is representation in speculative Latinx literature. And so I'm particularly in regard to what we call the white savior complex. And so I'm going to spend about half the presentation I'm sort of uh, mapping out some of the issues with um, representation in speculative Latinx literature, and then the second half grounding it in a few um, literary examples. So <clears throat> a few years ago, um, I co-edited and published this edited works um, that uh, Dr. Carmona mentioned earlier. And it's one of the first to uh, theorize and codify uh, Latinx speculative aesthetics. And so we specifically use the term speculative because it's an umbrella genre, which includes um, horror, science fiction, and fantasy. And just more generally, it's a really useful term because if you think about any sort of fantasy um, or science fiction film or show that you, or novel <laughs> that you read, viewed recently, it's very difficult to sort of neatly parse out like fantasy from science fiction, right? And it's a very popular genre right now. Um, but within the Latinx context or within the context of um, speculative aesthetics, Latinx speculative aesthetics, um, we use this term because it also underscores how Latinx authors and cultural producers intentionally uh, blend these genres as sort of a reflection of cultural um, intermixing or mestizaje. More generally though, and while there are important distinctions of course between science fiction, fantasy, and horror, um, sort of a useful way to approach the sort of intersections among these three genres is to understand how all of them, to some extent, ask the question, what if? And the past five or so years has been a really exciting time for Latinx, Latinx speculative aesthetics because there's been sort of um, a boom, if you will, or explosion. Um, folks are always asking me, um, because of this anthology, oh, have you read XYZ uh, science fiction? Um, book by so and so, and it's just like I can't even keep track of it, which is amazing. Um, but let me back up and very quickly and kind of highlight some of the issues that Latinx cultural producers have bumped up against um, and, and have had to sort of um, challenge and, and transform. So, one of the problems with the speculative genre and um, especially uh, science fiction and fantasy is that it's rooted in, and this surprises many people, it's, it's rooted in colonialism. But it also makes sense when you have like white uh, Europeans coming into contact with non-white folks um, and then sort of imagining them as um, the other and alien and then uh, assigning them negative characteristics, right? And so you see this, for example, or you see traces of it, um, even in maybe more what we think of as innocent texts like um, Jonathan Swift's uh, Gulliver's Travels. Um, and so the Lilliputians, I think that's how you say it, Lilliputians? Or <laughs> um, sort of like these like weird like little alien others. And it's been a very long time since I've read it, but as I recall, um, they were also ascribed all kinds of uh, negative uh, characteristics. Um, but this is also symptomatic of this kind of colonial 
um, speculative imagination. Um, also, science fiction um, as a genre solidifies at the height of British imperialism. And if you're interested in that topic, um, we write about it in the introduction, but John Ryder has an amazing entire book or monograph about it. Another issue, um, and you see this from the beginnings of the speculative genre um, or the beginning of horror fantasy science fiction, um, is the way the notion of monstrosity and the monstrous is tied to othering and racialization and how people of color have always sort of um, been a sort of stand-in for monstrosity, right? Um, and, and what we fear, the other. Um, and so this is something also that, for example, to give you a very recent example, like uh, Black writer, director, um, Jordan Peele takes to task. Um, and that's why a lot of his film is so um, kind of revolutionary, is that he flips this on his head, flips it on his head. And I'm gonna talk about how a few um, Latinx authors are doing that. Um, and also, this is really important to, to reckon with because how we imagine the other or like how we think about other people, of course, shapes action, right? Um, Otto Santa Anna, another scholar, wrote a book called Brown Tide um, Rising, where he looks at the way metaphors of like um, monsters and invasion, these uh, metaphors used to describe um, undocumented immigrants actually affected um, both violence against uh, Mexican immigrants, as well as um, legislation in, in California and other places. Um, so, so here's a quick example of, um, I don't even know if this show's around anymore, but um, Grimm, um, so like the Grimm fairy tales, um, there's a Chupacabra episode, and I remember being really excited to see this episode, but um, unfortunately the Chupacabra was just a thinly veiled um, embodiment or metaphor for um, like xenophobia against uh, Puerto Ricans. Um, and so I don't know if you can see it but um the guy on top if i recall he's puerto rican and then it's a white guy below him and you know the the chupacabra is a kind of like um like vampire like creature and um so moving on um the white savior complex so often within and this is of course is not just limited to speculative um aesthetics so Latinx speculative well not Latinx speculative aesthetics but speculative aesthetics we see this across genres um and so when i teach this and if you're one of my students in my undergrad classes you're going to hear <laughs> hear this again here a few weeks um i like to call it like the matt damon complex um because it's in all these like sci-fi <laughs> Um, the films where he's basically the white savior, right? And so Elysium for me, and I know it disappointed a lot of critics, um, was a missed opportunity um, because you had like all these amazing like Chicano and Mexican um, actors, like I think Diego Luna was in it. Um, and they all played like the typical sidekick, right? And there's this trope within science fiction and horror that the sidekick um, gets you know, killed right off the bat, or the, at the very least, like they are the very best, like they might make it for a while, but then, you know, at the end they die. And then the white guy survives and saves everybody. Um, so, and then just more broadly before I segue here, um, what am I doing on time? Um, okay, so more generally, uh, Latinx, uh, cultural producers um, are, have been excluded from um, publishing. Um, and, and this is the reason why when the anthology or the edited collection came out, people were like, whoa, there's like Latinx speculative novels, well, what science fiction, what? Yes, um, but it's, it's been a struggle because um, a lot of Latinx authors and people of color have had to create their own presses, like Jade Press, right? Um, and then there's just been a general lack of representation of not just Latinxes, but minorities more generally in the speculative genre. And then when we are represented, 
um, you know, we get killed pretty quickly. Okay, so what I want to do is look at a few, or just discuss quickly a few um, works and how they um, upend these tropes of um, the white savior complex as well as uh, monstrosity. And so um, I won't go into the other two and I'm not sure. Chris, can you see David Bull's book on the, on the far right? Yes, I can. Okay, because on my screen, yeah. okay, this is just how you have your screen arranged. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see on the far right, um, so this is a series, um, it's, it's for children and young adults, I believe. And, um, and you can see right away that rather than like one singular white savior, there's like two kids of, of color. Um, I believe one of the protagonists is an Afro-Latina. Um, I just read um, Tears of the Truffle Pig um, very recently. It is a trip. Um, this is an adult book, um, but it centers around a kind of Chicano, um, almost like anti-hero. Um, so it plays with uh, speculative conventions in all kinds of ways. But I wanted to focus on, of course, um, Dr. Garamona's um, El Rinche, um, and this is volume one, and volume mm -hmm. two is about to come out? In the spring, yes. In the spring? Yes. yes. Okay. So, and then actually the piece I'm going to talk about um, right after this is making similar moves to what you're doing, Dr. Carmona. So, um, if you're from the Valley or you're familiar with South Texas history, um, or maybe if you haven't studied Texas history in a formal way, um, there are a lot of things down here that, and I'm from San Antonio, and so like I grew up with like the myth of the Alamo. Um, down here, I feel like sort of this, so Richard, uh, anthropologist Richard Flores calls the Alamo the, um, this kind of master symbol. I feel like the King Ranch is sort of the same thing down here um, that most people or the way it's presented in popular culture is presented as a very like positive thing. But when you start excavating and digging, um, there's uh, quite literally a very dark history there. And so the novel takes place in the early 20th century when there is a lot of violence toward um, Mexican Americans and trying to remove them from their lands and using this, um, I like to call this kind of like paramilitary vigilante group called the Texas Rangers who were forcibly removing um, Mexicans, Mexican Americans from their land. Um, students are often and folks more generally surprised to hear that um, the, the Texas Rangers weren't actually an official part of the police force until um, around the 1940s, I believe. Um, and so the, the main character um, Johnny, is that how you say it, <laughs> Dr. Goodwin? Yes, it's Johnny. Uh, yes. Is or or um, the Ghost Ranger of the Rio, Rio Grande, El Rinche Fantasma del Rio Grande, uh, and this character um, who's Chicano, mixed race Chicano, um, combines sort of features of Zorro and um, the Lone Ranger, who's a sort of prototypical like white savior, right? Um, and uh, Tony's uh, family, or most of his family, has been murdered by the, the Texas Rangers or the Rinches. Um, and so, really interesting characters. So he's this kind of, um, this like ninja with machetes and he has like a six shooter. Um, we find out that he's been trained by Hiro, a Japanese samurai whose family has moved to Brownsville um, to capitalize on um, the natural environment, the fishing industry. industry. Um, it's also different, qualitatively different because um, there's more collective aspect to it that kind of decenters the, the single male hero. Um, there's some interesting multicultural um, kind of enemies that, that he faces. Um, his side, his sidekicks, and I'm, are y'all able to see my face or what I'm, my gestures? Yes. No, okay. Can, yes. <laughs> I didn't realize that. 
Um, yes. I'm doing some scare quotes with my fingers. Um, uh, so there's a, a Native American, um, I don't even want to call it like sidekick, but sort of secondary, um, but like rich characters. Um, one is Thaldo, um, as well as an African American, uh, Marshall Bass Reeves, um, who's also sort of seeking justice. Um, and then, and this is a good segue into the next piece that I want to briefly touch on. Um, this, while, while there isn't monstrosity um, in a kind of figurative way, like we see in sort of typical like horror films where there's a zombie or something, um, there is a notion of like the monstrous and horrific as embodied by um, you know, the Texas Rangers or the King Ranch or um, the Stillmans. Um, do you call it Stillmans in the book? I forget. Or still um, they're not mentioned. It's still well. Still well. Yeah, okay. But they're not mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and so essentially the, these names and um, institutions represent sort of like the horror of, of white supremacy, right? So like um, they're, they're the bad men, you know, the um, bad hombres, so to speak. And so then, um, I wanted, Dr. Gautamon, how, how, how much time do I have? I meant to start my start watch. I feel like I'm- You got about, you got about uh, three minutes. Okay, cool. So um, there's another series, um, it's called Shadow. If you're a teacher or you have children, um, this uh, series is amazing. It features an Afro-Latina who has supernatural um, abilities and it takes place in New York. Um, and it does similar work that I've been talking about. Um, and then I wanted to sort of wrap up by touching on this amazing short story um, by uh, Terry de la Pena. Um, it was published in 1996 in um, this, um, even though there's this like white woman <laughs> on, on here, um, the, the story is actually about a Chicana lesbian uh, vampire. And the, the short story completely flips both like the white savior trope as well as um, notions of the monstrous on its head. And in some ways, the issues that it, that it touches on um, around um, like surveillance and policing of brown bodies is uncanny and even prophetic because this was written in 1996. And so basically this Chicana lesbian vampire um, named Refugio, um, Refuge, right? And her, um, her lover, La Noche, who's this kind of shape-shifting black dog, um, are pr protecting the, the barrio. And they're protecting it from Stan Maxwell, who's this kind of self-appointed uh, vigilante figure um, who is so, um, similar to uh, George Zimmerman, right? And he's going after this like young Chicano uh, guy, um, teenage guy, Mario. And at the, at the end, well, before I get to the end, I wanna read really quickly. And I feel like this also connects back to Dr. Carmona's novel um, where uh, Refugio is talking about who's the ostensible monster, right? About what's actually monstrous. Um, uh, Benya writes, trudging home in the darkness before, before dawn, I felt weary, not from my shift, but from continuing to exist in a racist um, climate of hate and injustice. Almost 600 years in this hemisphere, I found it ever more difficult to remain silent when confronted either by bigotry or denial of its prevalence. In my time, I had dealt with all kinds of big, bigotry, conquistadores, revolutionaries, Texas Rangers, the US Border Patrol, the LAPD, to name a few. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there. But it also, because this is supposed to be a story about a vampire, right? So you have sort of certain expectations. And so like, she's not the actual monster. The monster is 
um, racism and structural inequality. Um, and then, um, I don't know how much I should give away, but uh, the George Zimmerman character gets taken care of and all of the other characters survive, which I think is really important. Um, and it's a collective effort. Um, if you like horror, you'll, you'll love the, and you're anti-racist, you'll love the ending. Um, okay, and so at the risk of being cliche, um, you know, why does this matter? And, and, and concluding here. Um, you know, literature shapes and representation shapes how we imagine the world and how we imagine other, other people and how we treat other people, right? Um, it also intervenes like right now within this kind of right wing conservative um, visual imaginary economy where, you know, people of color, not just Mexicans, but like people of color are imagined as like this bad hombre figure. Um, and so this literature you know, flips that on its head. Um, and then I also think just a sort of a general observation is so cool that there's been sort of an explosion, um, like Dr. Carmona's volumes of uh, children's and young adult literature that, um, again, flips all these things on its head. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, So now we're gonna do the last presentation, which is going to be Isaac Chavarria, who's going to be speaking about comics, Mexican and American comics, and how they, uh, what they represent. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Isaac. All right, so let me see if I can figure out how to share a screen. Share. Is it sharing? It is sharing, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> it's saying it's that, there we go. Now. There you go, <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> oh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Jeez. All right. I can't see myself, so can you all see me? Yeah, we can see you. All right. So hopefully you can see everything. So mm -hmm. I turn my mixed media with, you know, which would refer to mixed media. And the concept here is um, how comics and Latinos come into, into play together. Right. So that's kind of the concept. I'm coming in from a very personal perspective, meaning I love comics. I have a huge comic collection. I've given some of it away, but I still can't get rid of some of it because I think like a lot of individuals or many individuals probably um, since I was like 12, 11, 13, 15, I, I cherished comics. That was like one of my first uh, enjoyable readings. I still remember my mom taking me to a garage sale and just I asking, I'm asking her, can I have these two comics? They're like, they were like 50 cents combined or dollar combined. And it was a DC comic, The Outsiders. Uh, and she, she was like, yeah, you can get it. And from there on, just it just amounted to a lot. Of course, like any other form of literature, history, it also presents ideas. So if we just assume that comics are nothing else but like drawings and artwork, then we should be, mis we are mistaken. Okay, so I wanted to go over this uh, Latino perspective. And the first thing you should be seeing is this concept, this magazine from 1950, Pancho Villa, it's a one shot, which means it was only one magazine. It's not like he had a whole series. So first I wanna cover some of the representations. Now you might be thinking this is a horrible representation and I'm not gonna say it's the greatest representation, but it's not such a bad representation. So I read the comic, um, not when it came out, but you know, I just read it in, my, in some of my research. So essentially Villa is, you know, a worker, his sister is going to be taken advantage by the Don. And so in reta retaliation, you know, Pancho v or Villa goes to talk to the, the Don. The Don has a, has a gun, you know, there's a struggle and Pancho Villa actually kills him by accident, right? Because it says there, you know, I kill him by accident. So he goes on a run, right? Because, you know, he's pretty much going to be killed if he doesn't go on the run. He's captured by bandits. He gets together with these bandits. Um, and then that's essentially how the story continues. And if you read the little portion right there, right, the little portion in yellow, it says rising from a lowly peon to a bandit general, it calls him the Robin Hood. And that's how the, that's how the comic book portrays him as a Robin Hood. And even at the end, you know, it does talk some of the historical portions. Um, 
and it pretty much at the end it says, you know, he did some bad things, he did some good things. I mean, who's to judge him? But maybe history is gonna will be the the final judge, right? And so to give you a better example, one of the pages where I felt like, oh, okay, you know, it's not such a horrible representation. I mean, we're not talking about the characters, the drawings, but just maybe just a, a concept, the idea. So it says, I am for Pancho. My parents suffered too. Give them a share, I say. And then Pancho Villa says, good. From this time forth, we steal from the oppressor and share with the oppressed. I have said it. And then the other guy says, hola. I don't know why, hola. You're right. <laughs> We will do as you say, right? I like that concept. Well, sorry, guys. I like the concept of stealing from the oppressor and sharing with the oppressed, right? That's, a, that's not such a bad concept. Um, so that is Pancho Villa, right? Not such horrible for 1950. Not perfect, but not so horrible. Uh, it does include a Texas Ranger story, a fictional Texas Ranger story. It does include another story. So Pancho Villa was not like, was probably the, the most of the current book, but you know, so there are occasions where there are famous characters, right? Famous characters whose history are told, mas o menos, more, more or less okay. Now, if you're going to go racist, this would be racist, right? Senor Banana, right? From Zip, Zip Comics 1943. So you can read what it says there while I'm talking, but essentially this is like a, a standard stereotype. Uh, comes from South American country, you know, long nose, doesn't speak English well, um, is always up to some sort of like stupid trouble, classic like racism, right? Um, and so these are representing ideas and concepts and teaching individuals, teaching kids. Right? That's, what, that's what they're doing. Uh, luckily, we have more modern, you know, representations in the form of superheroes. Green Lantern, Jessica Cruz, who is Mexican-American slash Honduran Mexican, Honduran Mexican-American, Blue Beetle, Jaime Reyes, who I believe is like strictly Mexican-American um, and is from El Paso, and then Miss America, America Chavez, who is an LGBT uh, character. Right? So we have these new individuals, not only just in superhero form, but in like major Marvel DC form, right? The, the big ones, not, not those small independent uh, presses that that sometimes are overlooked, right? So we have now modern representations, which is great, great, right? If you're wondering like, what is, where are you coming in, Isaac? Where's your stuff, right? So my stuff is just um, like a rasquache kind of, kind of form, meaning I'm doing it with the technology I have, with the ideas I have, and with the talent I have. And the talent I have is not like high level talent, right? So don't, you know, don't think. But what I like to do is mashups. So just like how these comics sometimes represent ideas and perspectives of that time period, I want my mashups, my, my media to represent ideas of that time period by using other people's artwork, right? If, are you, if you're asking yourself, Isaac, what about copyright? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think about copyright, right? I didn't think about that. But this scene is from Infinity Gauntlet, and some of the pictures, images, are in real life pictures. Obviously, that wasn't in the Infinity Gauntlet. They were seeing images of what was going on in the world. If you haven't seen the Avengers film, um, I'm not going to spoil it to you, all right? So what I did is like, because the saying says things are getting pretty ugly out there. That's a sentiment I feel as well, right? but not to the images from the comic book, to the images of real life. So what I did is I switched I, those images from the Infinity Gauntlet to some of real life to represent how I felt and how you know, sometimes comics represent the, the reality. So you see a mixture of images like protest, um, you know, other kind of protests like Proud Boys, detention centers, you should look up the pic, the video of the woman who's wearing a Puerto Rico shirt and she's being told like, you know, you're in America, don't wear that shirt. You know, I want to explain that, opioid and Emmett Till. I'm going to go through these fairly quick. So another inspiration, right? So I told you about how I love American comics. 
But, you know, growing up in the border, I also loved Mexican comics like Condorito. If you don't know who Condorito is, you know, take some time later to search it up. But essentially, Condorito is this character that, you know, there's just like jokes, right? Or small stories that end up with like a joke. When somebody is so amazed, not, not amazed in a necessarily positive way, but is so surprised by what he says, they, don't, they go plop, right? Sometimes he goes plop, but most of the time other people go plop. So that's essentially what, what Condorito is. And so I love this comic, right? It's funny. So I put my, what I did is I did another mashup. I kept the images, but with Photoshop, I took away the words and I put new words right? New words to express a feeling that I had. Sometimes it's satire. So sometimes it's supposed to be funny. Sometimes it's supposed to be sarcastic. Um, I'll read this quick. So it says, compadre, is that your voice, Raimundo? I thought you were busy today. Weren't you taking the citizenship, citizenship exam? Well, yes, I'm just getting back. Don't tell me you actually get to stay here. Ha ha, you're not the only one who can study and answer questions. I'm smarter than a weddle. Sure, sure. Now you'll stop eating chiles rellenos, if it makes me American. Let's go over to Chili's, get some drinks to celebrate your citizenship, citizenship, Mr. American. Celebrate? That's ridiculous. I have to do my part and protect the border now. And then he's like so surprised by his answer that he goes plop. Uh, my personal opinion there is that, sorry guys, but sometimes individuals believe themselves so American that they only see that nationalistic perspective rather than their historical or um, maybe community perspective, which happened to this individual. Okay. Santo is another one of my favorites, uh, or just any Mexican favorites, right? The wrestler. So I won't read it this time, but there's a biography. And so I, there's actually a Santo comic where it says created June 29, 2018. That means created by me as far as like the words, not the actual comic. The comic is uh, much older. So you see, what essentially I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put uh, modern issues into these comics which have Mexican or sometimes Latino characters. I'm trying to change in some cases uh, the representation of the character. And I've done that in other ones. Um, and in these I use the character strength in order to promote a certain topic or a certain issue. Right. Let me see. I think I have like two, three more and I have like a minute left. Okay, Mexican histori or historietas, right? If you ever, I don't know how to say this, right? But if me, okay, I'll just talk about me. Me growing up, I had a dad that used to read these, right? Some of these were like, as you can see in the pictures, were like groseros, right? They're a little bit mm, on, on that <laughs> side. Some of them were like vaqueros. Some of them were just other stories. Uh, you know, I would say typical macho stuff in, to, to them for the most part. I tried to be funny in some of them. Like this one, I included the valley. So I'll read this real quick. Mientras en la pulga de Alamo. Oh yes, estás buzzing? No, pues sí, está. Miro la música en tus ojos. The, the couple danced and drank until la banda played the last song of the night, clavado en un bar. Your dress is bien chido. It's all 1900s. I love you. I thank you, pero un baile solamente es un baile. The bells rang and the light-completed Mexican Cinderella, a goodbye began. I have to get ready to cook tamales. Yo soy la carne y tú eres la masa. The couple kissed. Sorry. That was the timer. The couple kissed, but promised <laughs> each other this was not their last dance. Que cruda, pero I think I'm in love. And then the dude says, what the fuck? Right? <laughs> all right last last four last four slides right so one of my i never got to complete this project is my will be my lifetime regret but guess he is essentially what if marvel has this comic called what if where they take different different events in marvel history and reimagine them for one issue what if you know captain america would not have been unfrozen right what if spider-man would have joined the Avengers, all these concepts cancel. Well, what if he joined the Fantastic Four? Anyways, my mind was, what if Selena had lived, right? That is an eternal question because she was so young when she passed away. What if she would have lived? And I wanted to create a graphic novel 
based on that concept. And I had an artist, a real artist, um, you know, I told them the idea and they did this beautiful artwork, right? And to me, that's an example of how we can include, include ourselves as Latinos in different ways, sometimes in humor, sometimes in satire, sometimes in this type of fiction that reimagines what the, you know, the past. And those are some of the images that the artist was able to create. Um, where you can see like the beginning of like, you know, where she's getting shot, um, the, when, she, when she's the truck, Yolanda Saldivar and in the morning. Um, and so that's what I've tried to do with my artwork, present Latinos in different ways, right? In much different ways in, in the past. And in some, and sometimes that includes using that past, that past artwork. And I'll end with Lalo Alcaraz, who's, you know, uh, hopefully well known and you can see how it's not just like one perspective like there are different Latino perspectives and sometimes that's what these comics can share um, and essentially I think that's it so I've done my time thank you thank you guys um, for your presentation so what I'm going to do now um, is I'm going to go ahead and throw it open. If anybody has questions for the for the panelists, uh, you can go ahead and uh, and ask them. You can just um, you know unmute yourself and ask your question, um, or I can uh, I have some questions here as well. So um, does anybody want to ask any other presenters any questions right now? Um, so what is the name of your book? Um, the name of my book is Posada Offerings of Witness and Refuge. Okay. And that's from Sundress Publications. And I'm, um, you can also, I'm going to put my handles in the chat so people want to connect with me. Okay, thank you. So I have uh, Sochi on, on the screen here. I'm going to ask her a question. Um, so you talked a, a lot about what you're working and you're dealing with the with the um, the Arizona kind of border situation. Um, can you talk a bit about the the dignidad Eteria that you're with, or sorry, the dignidad Eteria and what that's all about? It it is hard sorry. to say Digni, dignidad literaria. Um, yeah. So yeah, I am not really with them. So what happened was. Um, this was out of the American Dirt drama, and um, so Janine Cummins wrote this book. The, her publishers were, you know, advertising it as like the next Steinbeck book, the next great novel that will help us understand the border. She got a million dollar, you know, advance on that book. Oprah was, you know, she got picked up by Oprah's book club. And um, an L.A. writer, Chicana uh, Miriam Gerba, read the book and she wrote a review and she tried to publish it in a major or she'd actually been asked to review the book for a major magazine and when she handed over the review they told her that that they couldn't publish it and basically it was because like well you're not famous enough to do this kind of takedown and so then she took that and um and took it to tropics of meta which is also by some friends in california a an online magazine and she published it there and I'm linking that. So it, the review became Pendeja, you ain't Steinbeck, my bronca with fake ass social justice literature. So like the title alone is gorgeous. Um, so that <laughs> review of that book, she really pushed like the conversation on that through her review, through social media. Then she got involved with David Boyles who, you know, um, we saw his book and also Roberto Lovato and the three of them joined up and created hashtag Dignidad Literaria. Um, and they were like, and they were just push, they were doing, they started by doing like a lot of social media um, pushback on the book. They were asking like, well, why is, you know, when Oprah did her big unveiling, there was a lot of pushback on that. And um, yeah, and then what, and then I got involved because Dignidad Literaria, they kind of posted a bunch of um, like how-tos, like, hey, do you wanna 
do you want to uh, go and, and protest her, her next reading? Here's how to do that. Do you want to help us? Here's how to do that. And um, Janine Cummins was supposed to be at my local bookstore. But um, when everything started happening, then the, then the, new, the new story was that like, oh, she's afraid of being, she's in danger, right? And she's afraid of what all these people might do to her. So, um, you know, this person who supposedly started out wanting to do some social justice work, which is BS, then turns around and says, oh, the people who don't like my work, well, they're, they're scary and they're gonna hurt me. So she canceled her reading. There was gonna be a big protest. She canceled the reading, the protest wasn't happening. And I was like, well, you know, it's like 15 minutes from my house. Why don't I just do something? So then I, um, so then I called up some people and I organized like a read-in at the bookstore. And then like my new thing is like, instead of just like a, like, you know, going in and like taking over a place is like, well, maybe I could talk to them. So then I hit up the bookstore and I was like, hey, you know, this writer is not coming anymore. You want some brown writers, some black and brown writers to come through? You know, you have that stage, you have that space. And they said, no, <laughs> but they were open to us. Like, you know, they were like, hey, you know, we ended up, there's a stage outside. So I took over the stage, which was my plan anyway. Um, and so, and they also were like, we can't do that. It's too last minute, but you know, we'd like to work with you on a reading. So. Um, then COVID happened. So there was going to be this amazing reading that was exciting and then COVID happened. I'm, and, and the person just, the, the bookstore just hit me up like last week, like, hey, let's make an online one. So um, that's how that kind of came around. It was just like, oh, I'm here and I could do this. And it doesn't have to stop just because this woman's not here. And it was really cool because like a mother and daughter had come to see the, the original and she was like, yeah, I saw that it was like Latina she's like a fake Latina, that's part of the problem. But, um, and so, and she's like, but then I found you and now I see, you know, and now I've all, met all these great writers. And so that was really cool. I got to meet somebody from the publisher who was like trying to argue with people who were like, it's too scary, she's in danger. And he was like, you're not scary. You're just writers who want to like your stories known. And I was like, yeah, imagine that. Um, so yeah, it was really cool. And anyway, so again, I'm not with them. I just kind of took up their call and made a couple of things happen. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Sochi. Does anybody from the audience have any questions? Now I'm going to skip over to John. Um, so, John, I'm going to ask you about the response of um, the literature from like um, people like a medical Paredes and even Jovita Gonzalez, maybe, um, and to this type of myths of of what. Uh, the border was supposed to look like. If you want to talk a bit, a little bit about that, John. Sure, sure. Uh, well, as I kind of mentioned, uh, the, the the kind of troping of the border as this kind of dangerous space of criminality has been around a long time, uh, and uh, you know, part of the work that you know, refusing to forget does kind of goes back to that moment a hundred plus years ago now, where uh, in fact, it was a dangerous place, but it wasn't because of, uh, you know, the people there, it was because the rangers were kind of executing people left and right. And so, uh, and it got so bad that the US military had to come, 110,000 troops came to the valley uh, to basically stop the rangers from murdering more people than they did. So uh, yeah, so folks have, uh, you know, the kind of trope of who's causing the trouble, right? It's, it's not, it's, it, it's you know, uh, it, it's mostly law enforcement is the, the problem, right? Racial profiling, collective punishment of communities, uh, so, you know, police brutality, all of these issues have been uh, present and continue to be present, as, as we know. So uh, basically, the writers take up this, this challenge of uh, talking about who's really causing the problems here. Uh, and uh, so, you know, Paredes definitely takes that up, Jovita Gonzalez. Uh, takes that up and and more uh, more recent uh, writers as well, of course, and I think 
<coughs> you know, if that if the, if there's been a common project for writers on the border, you know, it's it's been that kind of uh, countering this characterization. So I'll go ahead and leave it there. Okay, thank you, John. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and ask Isaac a question here. Um, so when you're doing these these kind of mixed still mashup things, um, you know, you're combining both. Are you have you ever have you thought about what you're doing when you when you're combining like American and Mexican comics at all, or you know how how you're working with that kind of stuff? Or those ideas yet? Is that you have one. like the Avengers. You have like the you have like the um, you know like the American ones where you have yeah. the superhero stuff, but then you have like the the Mexican comments, but you keep them separate. You haven't really mashed them, those two no. together yet. <laughs> no, no. I mean that's uh that's probably like an advanced, advanced way of of mash mashing it up. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess I I'm still keeping them like those, those type of comics uh separate. Um, yeah. I, and, and then I want to go into things that are not even a comic, so the, the whole like Selena thing. But of course, mm -hmm. if you've ever dealt with anything Selena, you know, like some, you're going to get a, a letter from a lawyer, a stop and <laughs> ease and desist letter. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I haven't thought about it. I don't know how I would mash it up. I think that would be weird. Um. Which is good. <laughs> That'll be weird to mash up American and Mexican characters, but that's that should be done. That's the whole point. Yeah. Right? So. Okay. So I have a question. That I, can, I guess I don't know if uh, if, uh, if if Catherine's back yet. Um, oh, we do have a yeah. question from Laura here. Um, so Laura is asking if you have you ever done some of your work using a familiar character like El Chavo El Ocho. It's not a comic, but being that it used El Santo, I'm just wondering. Um, the unfortunate part is like, I have no artistic skill, right? So my <laughs> mind has thoughts that I would love to do this, but my, my, my talent is like, no, you can't, <laughs> you have no talent. So I have to rely on others. The, the unfortunate part about relying on others is not taking advantage of another person, right? Like, how do I ask an artist, can you do this, but who's going to have ownership of it? Um, and, and that's just me because I don't know how to do that, right? Other people know how to do that. I don't. So I've thought about, Chavo. oh, so one thing that I used to do, not with necessarily travel the Locho, but I used to make shirts. I used to make my own shirts with like, so I, make, I made a Los Tigres del Norte shirt, like a band shirt, because I could never find a Tigre, Tigres del Norte shirt, if I, even online. So I was like, but I want a band shirt of Los Tigres del Norte. So I made it. So I would do something like that with Chavo and Ocho, but now there's Chavo and Ocho stuff, which is great. But, you know, I, I try to think of different things. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, um, Katie, I was just gonna ask you, um, especially when you're dealing with this, uh, the, the, when we're looking at speculative fiction, um, you know, how has the Latino authors made inroads to even change up the, what we think about as that genre? And, you know, because I know a lot of people look at speculative fiction and they always, you know, ask me about ma magical realism or something, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's not the same trope, yeah. So how would you say that they're, you know, looking at that differently and how have Latinos tried to change the, the genre itself, like Latino writers? Yeah. Yeah, I'm so done with, with, with magical realism. Um, not really, but it, it's one of the reasons um, that I think it took so long for there to be um, like a codifiable <clears throat> Latinx speculative genre because everyone, anything that had anything quasi supernatural went under the rubric of magical realism, right? Um, so one of the things that Ben and I wrote about in the introduction to El Termondos is um, I mean, you don't want to homogenize on the one hand, but on the other, um, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's just like so many examples of how like characterization, plot, tropes have been, you know, transformed. And then what I find most interesting and what I'm doing work on right now is looking at how, and this isn't necessarily 
on behalf of, or something that's intentional on the author, but reading texts that are not normally considered um, gothic horror or to be horror as through the lens of gothic horror. So for example, um, your short story, Strange Leaves, I've taught as part of the gothic horror genre, um, as well as the short story, Woman Hollering Creek, um, which is in the larger book of short stories, Woman Hollering Creek by Sandra Cisneros. Um, and so the, the point being is that when it comes to not just Latinxes, but also people of color, the way in which just writing about sort of like um, reality or lived experience um, reconstitutes like what we think about um, in terms of horror. Um, you know, and same thing with like what Jordan Peele is doing, um, particularly in his film Get Out. And I don't know if you, you all are watching the series, um, Lovecraft Country. Uh, Lovecraft Country, which is very, in, thematically in some ways, very similar to, to Get Out. And like, you don't know whether or not to be more afraid for them because of racism or because of like the weird monsters. Mm, yeah. All right, thank you. So we do have a question and I don't know if this is directed at me or um, the whole panel here, but um, let me start here. It says, I'm about to start reading El Rinche for my Mexican American literature class. And I would like to know what it is you want me to understand at the end of the book and how you would like me to view this story. Um, that's a tough question for an author <laughs> to answer. <laughs> uh, I, I want mean, the I answer. Can't really answer. Yes, I can't give you the answer because it's really about your interpretation, what you get out of it. I don't want, that's like the cop out author answer, but there's a reason for it, right? Um, I think it's whatever, I mean, there's, there's obviously what's going on, but I think that what you get out of it is more important. I tell you, I intend for you to get out of it, right? And that's the way, that's the way I'm going to answer that question. Um, I think that's directed at me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so um, this one is from Median Rocha, and she asked, um, is any, anyone in the panel, what has been the response for your works from the Latinx community? So I'm going to open that up to you guys. Sochi and Isaac. And um. I'm sure a lot of us feel this, you know, that we're afraid that we're not brown enough, Latinx enough, Ch for me, Chicana enough, right? So um, that's always kind of a scary thing. When my book came out, I actually had a lot of anxiety about it. I don't know if other folks with books have had that. I feel like that's something people don't tell you, you know, like you're so excited, you think it's gonna be the best day of your life and then it comes out and it's like, oh my God, everyone's gonna know I'm a fraud and I'm not anything and it, it's gonna suck and I hate, you know, it was awful. So, um, but thankfully, you know, I've gotten lots of wonderful responses. I got, and then I think one of the most important things that happened to me with that was that I um, went to Macondo in 2016, mm -hmm. the summer of 2016 and I've gone a couple more times and so just, you know, being with Latinx folks and having them embrace me and like, I was like, okay, oh, yeah. okay, I'm, uh, I'm okay. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah so the Mekondo, the, I think that's where I met you the first time, is at the Mekondo in 2016, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, so Isaac, we're gonna have to talk about yours as the other, as the other author on the panel or creative writer. Say again, <laughs> oh, about my work? Um, yes. I, I need to put my work out there more because especially with the comic stuff, again, the concern is like copyright, right? Like I personally don't care about it, but I know obviously <laughs> people who publish it are going to care about it. So, you know, that, that's, that's a thing where I have to be, I have to be careful uh, because I mean, like I put it posted on Facebook and things like that, uh, which, you know, kind of like is a borderline, but you know, other people, yeah, I know you. I know. I know what you're thinking. You don't care about copyright. Like I was giving my book away for free. Sorry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Isaac like, does not care about selling his stuff. <laughs> somebody, some, I just had some friends call me like Isaac. I think is the only true socialist around here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the press, the press does care about selling your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes, that's all right. Um, so. If, there's any other questions out there? No. If not, then I want to thank everybody who came to the panel. We um, thank you everybody that, that was here. We had a great panel. We had a lot of people. We had over 50 people um, mm -hmm. attend this panel. So I want to congratulate us all the panelists. You guys did a great job. 
And um, you want to give them a round of applause, <laughs> the virtual applause. <laughs> yes, and thank you guys. So hopefully you guys, some of you guys will be joining us for the next one next month when we're going to be talking about um, ethnic studies and education in, in public schools as well as, as higher education. Well, thank you guys. And I will be putting this up on YouTube probably tomorrow. All right, thanks. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. It's greatly appreciated. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Sochi. I wore my Selena shirt. It was an accident. I was like, oh, that was a good choice. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did it on purpose. <laughs> yes.